In this video, I'll be running through the framework that you should be using as to how to approach changes or usage of target ROAS on a Google campaign. This applies to shopping, search, performance max. It does not matter what the campaign type is. The fundamentals of how you should be thinking about and then approaching target ROAS remain the same. I'm not going to be telling you in this video the exact percentage changes that you should make, exactly when you should use a target row as and when you shouldn't. They should all be obvious once you understand the fundamentals of what target row as is and then what the two core upsides and downsides are that you need to take into consideration with your specific account. Number one, how does target row as actually work? How target return on ad spend works is similar to a bid cap on Facebook. The campaign uses historical conversion data that's accumulated within the campaign to be able to infer who it should prioritize in its bids moving forward in time. And now that is typically done with a degree of time decay as well. What do I mean by that? Well, if a conversion occurred 90 days ago, that's going to be weighted less than a conversion that occurred yesterday. Time is of relevancy. And so if you're accumulating a lot of conversions now that are from a specific demographic, you're going to optimize towards that demographic over a prior intent signal. And now this isn't just occurring across a few core demographics. So this isn't occurring just across age, gender, location, et cetera. Target ROAS and smart bidding models, particularly on Google, are using 60 million plus different psychographic data points that Google tracks on its end consumers. And so it's looking at your estimated income. It's looking at estimated whether you're a renter or an owner. It's estimating uh, how many people you have in your household. It's estimating dependents within the household. The list goes on and on and on, and it's through all of these data points that Google can look for similarities within consumers that are purchasing from you and can therefore go and prioritize those types of consumers moving forward with the way that it's bidden. Now, there's a really cool concept here, which is that you need conversion data. If you don't have conversion data, and if you don't have lots of it, you'll generally have poor modeling and poor results through a target row as strategy. Now, why you need lots of conversion data is because if you don't have a lot, you suffer from small sample size bias. If you only have five conversions within the campaign or 10 conversions within the campaign, you're very likely going to have trends that will appear that won't actually be accurate or hold at scale. And so you might have six, seven, eight, uh, females aged between 20 to 25 in a particular state that purchase from you, but that might not actually be your target demographic that you want to prioritize. And it was just chance that that occurred because you're looking at an incredibly small sample size of purchase behavior. And so you need to make sure you have lots of volume and you need to make sure that that volume is contained within the campaign as well. And this goes into a conversation about segmentation too, which is that conversions and conversion data, when you use target ROAS, is all primarily contained at the campaign level. You will not get it borrowing conversions from other campaigns to improve its modeling. Now, it does, to a slight degree from what we're aware, inherit some conversion data from the account level, and that's what allows you to launch a new campaign within a high conversion volume account, and it still works fairly well right out of the gates with target ROAS, um, but I would not be relying on that as a mechanism for you to be able to use target ROAS or for you to be able to hyper segment a very low budget account. So that's how target ROAS works and that's the mechanics behind it. It decreases budget allocation towards cold audiences which aren't showing high intent signals and it will instead narrow down to historical data and essentially lookalikes based on who it thinks will buy. So number two, using our understanding of the above what are some core truths that we can reason from? We know that target ROAS uses historical conversion data to improve its modeling and target those types of people. So what do we know from that? Well, number one, we can immediately assume that as you increase the target ROAS in the campaign, you're going to increase the risk of a spend decline. You cannot go into a campaign and put a 1 million target ROAS and the campaign's going to go and hit it. And the simple reason for that is because CPA equals CTR divided by, and I'm having a blank right here, but conversion rate. And so your cost per acquisition or your efficiency is a function on Google of the cost per click and the conversion rate on the website. And there is local and there is a local maxima for both of those. 
So there was only so high that you can get conversion rate and there was only so high, sorry, so low that you can get CPCs. And so you cannot drive CPCs to one cent and you cannot drive conversion rates to 100%. And therefore you can't achieve a 1 million ROAS. There are constraints on the ability to do so. And so with that being said, as we start to increase our target ROAS, what we're doing is restricting the ability for the campaign to place on audiences that it doesn't show a very high degree of similarity with historical conversion data. So where previously it may have gone and bid on a 55 year old male based in uh, Queensland, for example, because it sees that, yeah, there's a lot of purchases coming from Queensland with males between 40 to 50. So we're happy extending out and bidding on a 55 year old. That's fine. It's close. If you bump the target row as that demographic will get cut and you'll narrow and you'll narrow and you'll narrow down the amount of consumers that the campaign's actually happy placing on. This comes with a lot of risk. Number one, it comes with risk of scale. You probably cannot scale a campaign if it has a really high target row as and it's restricted down the demographic that it's targeting. Number two is if it restricts down the demographic that it's targeting, well, it now starts to funnel in bias data into the model. If it's only going to target males in Queensland, age 50 to 55, well, now you're only going to get new data into the account, which is from males in Queensland, age between 50 to 55. And you, so you start getting into this reinforcement loop. Now, the way that Google would prevent this is that they would allocate a degree of your budget towards testing new audiences, testing new demographics, key terms, products, psychographic data points, the list goes on. However, if you put that target row as high enough, it's not going to do that. It should not allocate budget towards testing if it needs to achieve a specific target row as you provide it. And so the testing budget zeroes out and you start getting in this reinforcement cycle. And that's where you'll see, and if you're a performance marketer that's worked across a lot of accounts, you've seen this guaranteed before, which is an account that's had a target ROAS on it for two years, and you've just watched performance slowly decline over time and spend slowly decline over time. And that's because of that reinforcement look, is that it's just reinforcing with the same target demographic and the same data. And then that data just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and refines and refines and refines until you end up targeting a very, very niche down audience. Yes, you might be hitting your target ROAS goals, but you're sacrificing volume to do so. So as you increase target ROAS, know that you are increasing the risk of a spend decline and a negative feedback loop where it cycles its own data into itself. And then number two, as you increase target ROAS, you increase the risk of bottom of funnel targeting. Now, what do we know about high intense signals? What do we know about consumers that are buying? We know that a consumer that's buying from us through Google, there's a high likelihood that that's already a warm audience to some degree with our understanding of how long an average consumer life cycle is, a buying cycle, sorry. And so when a consumer interacts with us, they don't just click on a shopping ad and buy. Now, some people do, okay, but most people don't. There is often a consideration phase that they go through before they end up making that purchase. There is likely some shopping around of competitors. There's likely some delay uh, so they can have the money to even make the purchase. They go on Facebook, they click on a few ads. There's a lot of interactions that occur across the omni-channel presence of the brand. And then finally, the click and the conversion occurs. And the click and the conversion might be at the very end of the funnel attributed to Google. Google claims it. And guess what? That then reinforces into the machine learning model of what it should be optimizing towards. And what should Google be optimizing towards? Well, the highest likelihood people to buy and the people that are going to drive the highest ROAS are those that have spent time on the website before, are those that might have purchased before, are those that have clicked onto the website from a referencing UTM parameter of Facebook. So it will start to reinforce that people that come from Facebook buy, people that have spent over 20 seconds on the website buy, so heavily place on those audiences. If someone has been on the website from Facebook and they then search for the product on Google, bid $10 to rank at the top because we need that click because there's such a high likelihood that that person is going to purchase and we will get the return. The probability is there. And so you end up, if you're putting really high target returns on these campaigns with a really high prioritization of bottom of funnel traffic, might not even look at like bottom of funnel traffic. You might look into your campaign and go, well, I have a 900% target ROAS and all my key terms that are converting, they're mainly cold. Okay. It's, um, it's brown armchair or it's like gray couch or it's standing desk, right? These are all key terms that aren't directly related to us as a brand. 
These are cold key terms. Yes, but these are probably being searched by people that have already hit the website before and now they're shopping for competitors and the campaign came in and placed with a $10 bid and just regained the click. And so even though it looks cold, it likely is still warm. Because explain to me how you only have 10 clicks on stand up desk as a key term, but you have eight conversions. How do you have an 80% conversion rate out of that key term? It's likely because some of these audiences are warm in some degree. They've seen your ads before. They've interacted with you in some capacity and they've ended up coming back at the bottom of the funnel with a super high bid that's captured them in, generated the conversion, attributed the ROAS. And so is this to say that target ROAS is bad? Is this all to say that you shouldn't use target ROAS, never use it, don't put it on campaigns? No. It's to give you fundamental truths that you can then use to reason from in your decision making. We know guaranteed that if you increase target ROAS, you increase the risk of a spend decline and a negative feedback loop. And we know as well that if you increase target ROAS, you increase, and I'm not saying you definitely increase spend distribution to bottom of funnel. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm saying you increase the risk. I can't say with certainty that if you have an 800% target ROAS on a campaign, that it's not doing bottom of funnel targeting. I just can't guarantee it. But if you have a campaign on a 50% target ROAS, and this heavy brand negative keywording going on, negative audiencing going on as well. I could say with a high degree of certainty that, hey, this is probably cold people buying. I could be pretty confident in saying that we're actually getting cold new customer acquisition here. And therefore I can make a reasoned assumption that we should bump budgets here and see if it increases new customer revenue. But if you have an 800% T ROAS, I can't say that with confidence. We can still test it. It could still be true, but you can't say it with confidence because the risk is there. And so it's just about assessing the risk parameters around the decision and whether you want to be increasing the risk for the return that you believe you will get. If you believe that increasing T ROAS in this particular instance in this account is going to yield better performance and it doesn't matter if it increases the risk of bottom of funnel because look, for this brand, they don't even have much bottom of funnel because they're not spending on any other platform, then cool, increase target ROAS, that would be a good decision. But if you have heavy spend on other platforms and you're actually really trying to avoid increasing risk of bottom of funnel targeting because it's a big issue with this particular account or your brand or this client, which is that all the platforms just want to spend on bottom of funnel. That's what they always optimize for. And we want to avoid that. We want to get new clicks in the system. We want to build up a top of funnel, new audience, and then actually drive new customer acquisition and drive new customer revenue increases. Well, then this is dangerous and this probably isn't the path that you want to go down. And the same thing applies here. If you really need to achieve volume and it's absolutely paramount and you cannot afford any kind of drop off in spend and you need to continue to layer as a part of your strategy towards profitability or your profitability targets, you need to keep layering in spend into Google, then this probably isn't the greatest idea because you increase target ROAS and every increase you put, you're going to increase the risk that you won't be able to spend anymore. Now, there's always a middle ground with these things. And that's why I can't give you a set SOP parameter sheet. And that's why I always think it's best to understand the ground truths and then make decisions from there. Because as long as you understand these, you can make reasoned decisions in very specific scenarios. So just keep both of these in mind anytime you're applying a T ROAS on a campaign and anytime you're making a change up or down, both are fine. Both are good decisions in very specific scenarios. You just need to take into consideration how it works understand how it works, understand the two truths and go from that.